Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hello, everyone. I hope that you have had a lovely start to your festive season and that you are still able to relax and enjoy this these couple of days as we head into the new year and 2021. So today I'm really excited to bring to you my conversation that I had with Professor Frederick Lewa. Frederick is a professor at the University of Brussels and his research interests lie in ecological aspects and functional roles of bacterial communities in fermented foods with a focus on animal products. And in addition to this, his interests also relate to human and animal health and well-being, as well as to the elements of tradition and innovation in food contexts. I reached out to Professor Lewa with regards to our red meat consumption and the information and misinformation that is out there in and around the place of red meat in our diet and whether there should be dietary recommendations which encourage us to reduce our red meat consumption. Professor Leroy and I go into a lot of detail in and around the historical and political context of red meat over time and also its place in the diet with regards to our overall health and the potential risks of consuming red meat for us. In addition to his professorship, Professor Lois also offers various societal contributions and these are all not paid, just part of his interests. So he is on the editorial board of Foods, the International Journal of Food Microbiology and the magazine Food, Science and Law. He's a board member of various academic non-profit organizations, including the Belgian Association for Meat Science and Technology, the Belgian Society for Food Microbiology, and Belgian Nutrition Society. He's president of the Scientific Committee of the Institut Danone Belgium, and effective member of the Advisory Commission for the Protection of Geographical Denominations and guaranteed traditional specialties for agricultural products and foods of the Ministry of the Brussels Capital Region. So sit back, relax and enjoy this conversation that I have with Frederic Lois on our red meat consumption. Good morning, Professor Frederic Lois. How are you doing this morning or this evening in Brussels? All fine here. Thanks. <laughs> good to speak to you. Yes, really good to speak to you as well. And I'm just so thankful that you're taking some time out of your well, your evening, really, to have a chat to me about something which I'm really passionate about. And equally, if anyone is going to ask me for someone I might follow on social media or pick up your academic papers that come out around red meat and in defense of red meat, it is your name that always comes to mind. No, that's very kind. <laughs> so I was introduced to your work, um, Frederic, through New Zealand Beef and Lamb when they brought you over here last year, well, it was 2019, in the Red Meat Sector Conference in Christchurch. How did you come to be this defender of red meat? It's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite a complicated story, to be honest. It's, um, it has to do with my, my background as a scientist. <clears throat> Uh, which started basically in bioengineering, you know, which is which is a field that combines biology with process engineering and so on. And I happened to have to to enter into um, so after I studied bioengineering and a thesis on nutrition, I moved into the field of microbiology and I started as a PhD student on an, on a European project that was dealing with fermented meats, mm. just by coincidence, if you will, it was really just a, a random food matrix that was given to me. I always liked fermented meats, that's not the issue, but it, it came a bit as, uh, as, a, 
as a non really selected topic in my hands. And then, and then I started to work on that and I started to look into the microbiology and the technology of fermented meats. And I've been doing that today for about two decades, I think. Yeah. But then at some point in time, and that must have been some seven, eight, nine years ago, I started to notice that people started to talk very emotionally and, and in hyperbolic ways about my topic of research, which was very odd because all the other people were not confronting this. They were working on all, either all the food matrices or they were even working on, on different topics outside of the food system. But my topic became very controversial. And as, as a, sorry to interrupt, but was your work attacked or kind of targeted or was it just the general area you'd just begun to notice? It was the general discourse around the topic. No, no, my work was very, was hardcore technological. It was really, it was really about the technology. There was nothing even societal or, or, or anything related to public health as such. I was working on things like food quality and food safety. So nothing really controversial. But my topic, my, my, my matrix, the, the thing I was looking at became suddenly um, a... a symbolically charged food item yeah. and I wanted to understand why that is the case because it didn't make sense to me you know I've, I've, because I've, I was teaching also I was teaching courses of nutrition and te teaching courses of uh, meat technology and a couple of other ones and so I knew the background and I started to see things appearing in, in media and in, and in you know, the, the, the public domain that were so uh, different from what, what I was used to and what I was um, teaching myself and, and something, something didn't, didn't make sense, you know, how meat suddenly became something that would be detrimental for, for our bodies, for the planet, for animal welfare. Suddenly it was bad for everything. And it used to be a, a nourishing food. It used to be something that represents good nutrition yeah. and it has always been valued. And then suddenly, and very quickly so, it became it degenerated into something that is basically bad for us. Yeah. And that attracted my attention. So I started to, to look into that. And to do so, I have uh, set up collaborations with people in different fields, that, including the humanities and you know, anthropologists and historians, just to try to understand what was happening. Yeah. So, uh, and, and to do so, I, start, I entered the debate in a way through social media, but amongst others. But if you want to enter that debate, you better be robust and you better know about nutrition and sustainability and the ethical part of, 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 the, of the matter. So you, because if, if you enter that, that debate and you just talk about the nutrition, it will quickly shift to the environmental part, right? Yes. Or, or vice versa, or they will start talking about animal welfare. So if you want to, to have the discussion going, you need to skill yourself in those three domains, which I tried to do over the last uh, couple of years. Yeah. And uh, that's, that appeared to be a niche <laughs> yeah. um, in research that people, you know, the, the horizontal approach to, to meet. And I developed my research within that niche, also interdisciplinary research, looking at, you know, discourse analysis and, and um, historical mechanisms and so on. Okay, so if I just kind of pick up on a couple of things there, and, and I think firstly, what I'll say is what I really appreciate about your work and what I've learned a lot from you is that much more holistic view on meat and not just from the nutrition side, which I'm really passionate about, because as a, a, as a practitioner, what I see time and again in my clinic are people coming in um, scared to eat red meat for a number of different reasons, um, alongside having blood uh, kind of nutrient biomarkers which are suggestive of requiring it for their health and there seems some in in some areas in and around I suppose other health pr practitioners talking about it there seems to be this kind of cognitive disconnect where you've got GPs in no disrespect to GPs or doctors or other health professionals saying you must cut down your red meat but on the other side saying you're low iron you need a supplement or you know you need this and there's this kind of disconnect however where I was kind of going with this question is actually can you describe to us your understanding of the anthropology around this and how we what makes you think about how we've evolved to eat meat from that anthropological kind of anatomical perspective well it goes it goes way back of course it's it, um at some point in time there was this transition towards a new diet and the transition basically is the result of 
ecological change and ecological challenges. So proto-humans started to move towards a different diet and a different food chain. And that has been in several stages and that must have been triggered first by you know, aggressive scavenging and, and looking for, for inside bone nutrients and so on. And, and bit by bit, we shifted the diet towards very nutrient dense foods. And, and with, with that transition, it, it also affected our physiology and our anatomy. So we adapted mm. to that new nutritious diet. And there's several theories that say that it also allowed us to grow the bigger brains. Yeah. Um, because if we could shrink the, the intestinal system and that energy could go to the brains. Of course, brain development is not just the effect of meat eating because, you know, carnivores are not necessarily having big brains, but it's uh, while doing so, we also needed to work together uh, to obtain that meat because we're not physically carnivores. We don't, we don't look like the big cats look like with the, with the equipment of a carnivore. So we, we are technological beings and we only managed to get those substantial amounts of meat through cooperation, through hunting. So there was also a, a drive for, for, um, for big brains because of the way we needed to develop certain social skills and so on. So it, it all was together in a intertwined mechanism that um, with the nutrient-rich food and with the new way of food sourcing and the, the, the first social human foundations that were laid, that made us evolve into what we know today as homo sapiens. Mm. And our bodies are fundamentally different than, than those of, of ancestors, which uh, were much more based on fermentation and, and, and health have also, you know, different, different requirements for, for specific nutrients. During the transition, we, we lost somehow the ability to, to uh, get the vitamin B12, for instance, from, from, from the gut system. So we need it from the food and it just, and, and a couple of other things have, have been modified because we were getting those nutrients directly from food and our body, you know, was shaped towards that uh, supply system. And we basically started to, to depend on meat. Mm. Um, and, and if the meat wouldn't have been there at some point, after we have adapted to it, then we just wouldn't have made it. We wouldn't be here today. So yeah. it, at some point we became so dependent on meat that it was absolutely crucial for survival. Yeah. It may not be the case today. Now you have the people that be, choose to be vegetarians or vegans and they, and they, they, they obviously survive. Some of them deal better with this situation than others. But the, the point is that the system today is completely different than it was before. So the natural system, which was our natural habitat, which was must have been more than 99% of our time on earth as, as humans um, was one where meat was absolutely needed. We didn't have mm. the supplements. We didn't have all those, you know, fancy food combinations that we can find today. Mm. So, and that is, that is also why it is anthropologic. So we, I just talked about biological anthropology, but mm. we also have the cultural anthropology and those two are very much connected to each other. Mm. Because if you, if your, if your society develop, develops with meat at its very core, because the hunting activity uh, has been has been fundamental. Uh, we were hunter gatherers. We were also gathering plant foods, yeah. obviously. But but hunting always was a, that special activity within the food system. Yeah. Even in maybe in some ecosystems, the meat wasn't all that high as in other ecosystems. But still, the hunting was a very important activity. Yeah. It, it's culturally very very important. Yeah. And the way we we collect the meat. And we share the meat and we use the meat to um, cement communities and to structure communities has always been very, very important until today. And, and that, that's interesting if you look now at, at all those meat replacers. You know, there's so many products that try to replace meat. Why they don't just go for you know, wholesome vegetarian plant-based uh, approaches? No, they try to have these meat imitations. Yeah. So it, this, this shows that meat is still something very special. So they want to get rid of it, but in a way they, they, they still want to keep it. Yeah. Because it's more than just the nutrition. It's meat is a layered food. It has so many layers which are nutritional and symbolic. And do you have a couple of kind of points in time where you, from your discourse analysis, which is, you know, looking at literature and seeing how people are speaking about meat and things like that. Can you think of any kind of a couple of points in time where there was a real shift from the, I suppose, the health promoting uh, literature around meat to it becoming this kind of scapegoat for bad health? Like any particular things come to mind or points in time? 
Yes, it's uh, there are several points in time. So the first one you could identify is is way back with the Neolithic transition, um, where people shifted to to agriculture, and the shift to agriculture has been also a shift in social makeup of of societies because it was the first time that people was started to accumulate resources, mm. and because of that, you were creating the first elites. Okay, so elites became those that had suddenly control over the rest and and the food system sh shifted to mostly to crop agriculture animals were needed but it was mostly for preparing the fields and and fertilizing the fields and for the traction and the meat was not all that abundant mm. and if an animal was slaughtered it was always very special you know, if you mm. slaughter an animal in in um, the traditional system that is agricultural based and and uh, you see that that activity was something very special it was a sacrifice mm -hmm. and and that animal was used to stratify your community so the, so the best piece of that animal went to the elites and the rest went to the to the public so from then on basically meat became a power symbol it became something that is desired and and people that didn't have it actually you know were seeing that as a, as, as an as a as a power power symbol and so the evolution after that is quite complex, so we'll not go into the details, but there's another very important transition point, which is the Industrial Revolution, mm. where meat suddenly becomes available again. And during that time, the middle classes that, that emerged uh, and, and that suddenly had purchase power and that suddenly also wanted meat again, started to look differently at meat in, in different ways. And because, first of all, the Industrial Revolution was able to provide more meat because of the technologies. And because of those technologies, meat entered a um, more hidden factory system, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world in the beginning, you know, the big uh, meat plants that you were finding in Chicago and so on. And that, cre that created the first disconnect between people in cities and people in, in, in the countryside. Mm. With people in the countryside being in daily contact with the animals, and then for the first time in history, probably people now in cities were disconnected from, from, from the animals and from the meat. And that has created quite a bit of problem. And the middle classes at that time already wanted to have everything that reminds them of, of the animal out of the city. So it had to go. So, so there were complaints by the middle classes about uh, the smells of the animals in the streets, because at the time, New York still had its animals within the city walls. Mm. Um, and and they, had to, they had to go. The, the middle classes didn't want to see the animals anymore because they were, uh, it was a violent thing to see. And, you know, that disconnect was created at that mo moment in time. So they didn't want the smells and the images. And it was bad for the youth as well. So for, for it, a bit like we look at video games, today, you see, it was something that, that was to be avoided because it corrupts. What you would have as another important moment is the mid 19th century. So a bit a bit later in the mid 19th century, you get the uh, first institutionalized vegetarian societies. Huh. And those are founded by Bible Christians mostly. Hmm. So those Bible Christians came from England and, and they moved to the United States as well. And then he also ended up in uh, worldwide a bit, but mostly in, in you know the, in the United States and in England. And they were very Puritan. And the interesting part is now that I've, so I've I've now portrayed very briefly and in a very sketchy way a, a cultural historical trajectory of meat and all its symbolic uh, ideas. Now you see that these Puritans that enter the scene suddenly will uh, portray meat completely in a completely inverted way. Um, suddenly meat is something that they reject mm. and they do so because uh, they say that it's, um, it, it will heat the body and it will provoke the passions and it, it's, it creates sexual desire. Mm. So all those rich ideas about meat, which is red, you know, especially we're talking about beef, it's red and it's sensual and it's abundant and it's representing all these connotations of vitality and, and those Christian sects basically want to get rid of that. They want to inverse it. Because basically, they're, they're very much centered on, on, on self-denial and on temperance. Mm. And, and that's when you get this first anti-meat reaction. 
Now, um, Professor, is this anything to do with Kellogg and the cornflake and Seventh Day Adventist? Is that in and around? Are these the, the types of groups yeah. that you're thinking of, or is this actually separate earlier? There were there were several groups, and uh, you first had the, the Bible Christians, which basically were inspired by by Swedenborg, which was a, a Swedish mystic. Mm -hmm. um, but after the Bible Christians, you also had uh, Sylvester Graham that had similar ideas. And then you also had the Seventh-day Adventists indeed mm -hmm. that had the same belief system in a way. They were, they were having the same ideas and they became the most influential afterwards. Yeah. Um, but it came just a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, but they're, they're part of the same current basically, mm -hmm. yes. But that remained rather niche in a way that never really became very big. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting point still is when Kellogg uh, connected all those Seventh-day Adventist beliefs to to, to the health discourse. Yeah. To, so he connected it to health and then it entered home economics and the first dietetic association started to take those ideas that basically came from Seventh-day Adventists for a large part, but they were connected to health. And, and from then on, it was always a bit in the background of everything that has to do with dietary guidelines. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would say it, it's even at the basis of what we see today as the healthy user bias. Yes. You know, the idea that meat is bad yeah. Um, and that is what we're capturing in nutritional studies. In a way, it comes from that seed that was there in the very beginning of, of the, the 20th century and, and the, the mid 19th century. Um, one of, it, when I looked at the discourses, uh, well, one of the things I did was looking at, uh, it's a very simple thing, but I used Google Books, um, Google Ingram, and I just entered the word vegetarian mm -hmm. into, the, into the interface. And you get a graph of the use of the word vegetarian over the years, how many times it has been used in, in, in basically public documents and books. And what you see is an increase that starts in the mid 19th century, you know, with, with the coming up of, of, the, of the Bible Christians. And then it increases, it's, it's becoming more prominent until the First World War. Mm -hmm. And then it stops. And then you have a flat line, nothing really changes, it's really a flat line until the 1970s. Mm. And from the 1970s on, it starts to increase again until today. Mm. So it's becoming again a word that is used more often. And th there's an interesting idea here that, um, that I found in a book made by Margaret Finn, she's, she's from um, Michigan University. And she made the connection between moral eating and social inequality. Mm -hmm. And and she uses a graph of, of Piketty, the economist. And um, in that graph, you see that the inequality rises, correspond with the rise in moral eating. Hmm. Uh, so the difference between the middle classes and the, and the elites is getting bigger during this exact same periods where you see a rise in vegetarianism. Hmm. And that has to do with, with the fact that if you're middle class, and, and you're very focused on status. That's what middle classes usually do. Yeah. Um, you're very much focused on status, but you don't have the financial means anymore to keep up with the elites. And you cannot impress your peers with a new car or with, with jewelry, or you don't have the money for that. So what, what you typically, typically do is you express your value through what you eat. And that turns out to be food that is light, that is... Um, pure and so on and it, that is basically vegetarian food that's dropping meat and it's interesting to see also that what is being dropped out of the menu is the most valuable food so in a way what they're saying is um, we are able to be functional and be good citizens without the most valuable food we can do that yeah you no know, it, it is an expression of value in, in a way now i'm not saying that all vegetarians enter that pattern but i'm, I'm saying that it's for sure has driven a part of the societal dynamic and particularly if I'm looking if I'm thinking about marketing campaigns now and what I see on social media with regards to vegetarian actually probably more more wholly plant-based vegan that idea of light of purity of yeah. energy um and those kind of concepts and being you know morally superior and not and i'm not suggesting that it's coming from like you know we're so morally superior but that just elements of it i'm seeing that today in social media yet mm -hmm. it sounds to me like there's a real history behind it with what you've looked at with regards to what you're finding in google books and, and things like that 
Yes, and and before before the, the Bible Christians um, made it a more formal system, it already shows during history. You already have throughout history, you will find examples of people that don't eat meat. Um, you have, for instance, Pythagoras and his um, um, his followers were kind of sectarian as well, uh, and they were very much uh, thinking about reincarnation and about purity, and they also dropped meat. You have the Gnostics, and you have several movements throughout history that were always following the same pattern of mm. self-denial and of purity. And that has been a systematic um, element always in, in, in people that dropped meat uh, for, for reasons of, of, of for spiritual reasons. Mm. And we, di we didn't really get rid of that until today. Even people that now um, often claim that they're doing it for the environment or for the animals, you still see that there's a strong element of purity behind what they're saying. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are studies also, there are studies, for instance, an Italian study that looks at what vegetarians and vegans are saying and why they're doing it. And what, what, you're, what you see from those studies is that typically you see a disgust um, of, uh, um, or a, uh, how to put it, it's what, what, the, what they state is that death is, is a contaminant. So death is something threatening. Death is always something bad. And they have, there's a kind of obsession with death. And, mm -hmm. and that's because I think as Westerners, we have difficulties in our post-industrial system to deal with, with death and, and, and life. That's not easy anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because indeed we don't have contact with those animals and we don't see how they're slaughtered and we don't, have the natural rhythms of life and death in our society. We try to push them away. But if you keep on doing that at some point in time, you get in, into cognitive difficulties. Yeah. And, and, and you get it from the discourses. And now, now, another discourse analysis that we did was, um, and well, the other ones were very rough, of course, but something more in detail was a, um, an analysis of mass media. And we looked at the Daily Mail in, mm -hmm. in the UK which is a big newspaper. Mm. Um, and we looked at all the articles that were published during 15 years on the topic of meat and health. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a very interesting exercise because what we saw is that half of the articles were saying that meat is bad. And the other half were saying that it's good for you or they were putting it a bit more ambiguously with both pros and cons. So that was conflicting as such. And, but, but interestingly also, what we, what we did see from the analysis is also that there was an increase in... Uh, sensationalism over those first 15 years of the century and uh, that's because the titles became longer mm. and become more inflated and also they became much more sensationalist mm. you really had inflated titles and you can really quantify that and we stopped our study in 2015 um, and 2015 was the year of the WHO IRC report on colorectal cancer and, yes. and red and processed meats and that's where we stopped the study but I think after that moment, it must have become even more hyperbolic after that, because what this 2015 event actually meant was that the entire anti-meat discourse, which was boiling under the surface since a while, since the, since the 1970s, basically, um, suddenly got also an endorsement by authority. Yes. Um, and that really makes it difficult to, to criticize it because you have the World Health Organization that is saying that processed meat is, is um, a cancer-causing substance and so is red meat to, to a lesser degree. Now, of course, what is in that report is much more nuanced and much more uh, well put than what people make out of it. Mm. But, but the problem is that you, you always come back to the same thing, uh, that whoever criticizes the, the conclusions of that report is basically criticizing uh, authority yeah. and, and the World Health Organization and the World Cancer Research Fund and all those dietary guidelines that adopt their messages. Mm. So it becomes difficult to be a dissident in that game. Nonetheless, recently, the, the, uh, the Nutrix Consortium stepped in and they basically made a loud statement to say that they're not agreeing with what was put in that report. Well, basically they're not agreeing with what has been made of that report, mm. uh, namely to say that we should heavily restrict red meat or processed mm. meats. Mm. Is there a lot of critique around what they're saying in the research that they've put together? Because for example, in um, one of the reasons I contacted you was very recently, the 
uh, New Zealand Heart Foundation had come out with a report saying that Kiwis need to reduce their red meat consumption from 500 grams a week to 350 grams of, of red meat a week cooked. Um, this is despite actually the last national nutrition survey being conducted almost 12 years ago. So in fact, they don't actually know what people are eating, but they've re-looked at some data and they've suggested, you know, this is what we need to do based on the health data and also the environmental data. Yet they didn't include the research that came to light last year where someone re-analyzed the data and came up with, which I believe is the group that you're talking about, actually that's not what we need to do. Why are people not looking at the research that um, the research like that and considering it in light of the other research? Well, it's, it's power play. Uh, of course, you have, you have different nutritional schools and those nutritional schools go back uh, several decades. Um, with, with the introduction of, the, of the, um, the dietary goals for Americans in the late 1970s, um, you already had that clash between people that were putting a lot of emphasis on those nutritional, um, on those epidemiological associations. Mm. And, and they were using those to justify very drastical interventions in, in how people eat. Mm. And at, this, at, at that time, you also had a dissident school that were saying, we don't agree with this because the evidence is not strong enough. Mm. And we cannot just have that giant, uh, gigantic experiment and just, Play, play around with public health because of experimental ideas. Now, the one school dominated because of all kinds of reasons, yeah. which are more um, political than they are uh, nutritional or scientific. And they dominated the discourse and that school became the dominating, the dominating paradigm and, and the dominant paradigm. And it was also uh, pushed very hard by Harvard University, for instance, and it remained in place for several decades. And the counter voices were quite suppressed, but they always have been there. Yeah. It's just that they didn't get access to the, to the main discourse. And we now see them coming up again. So uh, now has a, the time has arrived today that they start to stand up again. And they say, look, we have, we have systems in place to evaluate quality of evidence. Yes. And if we apply those systems to the evidence, we don't agree that this should be done because the evidence is just too weak to make such a hard conclusion. Yeah. And we saw that already in 2015, when we ended the study on the discourse, um, there was immediately after WHO published its, its report, there was a, um, an opinion letter from, uh, written by Gordon Guyatt from McMaster's University. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the, the, main, the main founders of the evidence-based medicine approach and of the great system that is used to, to uh, look at evidence. And he already said at that moment in time, he said, uh, look what WHO is doing here is a disservice to the public. Mm. Uh, this is not good science. We shouldn't do this. Mm. But that was just an opinion letter. And yeah. it, it was hardly noticed because it was not having, it was not amplified and it was not um, getting to policy levels. And then it just disappeared in history. But the Nutribix consortium is basically, again, Gordon Guyatt. He is the, he is the, the godfather <laughs> in yeah. that consortium. It's it basically mostly uh, Johnson that is driving it, but, but Guyatt is there as, as, the, as the one that is, is um, not only giving it authority again, yeah. but also is, is supervising a bit the whole, the whole enterprise. So it took him several years, but now he's there with a series of articles that are to be taken seriously. And we can just brush them away and we can go on like we did before. And we will just see every year after each other, we will see how metabolic syndrome increases and how diabetes becomes more problematic. Mm -hmm. And nothing is changing. Nothing is, is being fixed here. Year after year, a situation of cardiometabolic diseases is getting worse. Yeah. So I think it's about time that we start saying that what, what we're facing is failed policy. Yeah. It's, we, we're having this for decades and it doesn't work. It is failed policy. Yeah. We cannot make, we cannot try um, just fixing it by making those guidelines even stricter. Yeah. By going from red, so red meat is always decreasing in amounts, right? Yeah. But we will end up with nothing because if you, if you do the, if you follow the Eat Lancet system, the planetary health diet, you even have to go below that for your 150 grams you just mentioned. Yes. So you can keep on restricting that and you can keep on putting emphasis on your whole grain and all the other things, but it, this will not turn around the evolution that we're seeing now. Somehow it's in their minds that the public is not following what they're saying. So we're going to say it more loud and more strict, mm. <laughs> but it's not going to work.
Yeah. And it's about time that we fundamentally, drastically change the way we uh, we deal with food advice or dietary advice because it's it's clearly becoming hugely problematic. And and at some point in time, social welfare will not be able to carry the costs of of all those chronic diseases. Yeah. And, you know, as I understand it, when I'm looking at the literature and, and I follow the, the work work of the likes of you and, and other scientists and, and also public health people, and we're looking at the risk associated with eating meat and the increased risk for colorectal cancer and cardiovascular disease and total mortality. And people are hanging their hats on this, you know, 17% increased risk. It might be statistically significant if you look at it from that um, statistical perspective but how meaningful is this increase in risk and what is the you know what is your understanding professor of the absolute risk associated with both processed and red meat um, and the relative risk and, and where there might be a disconnect yeah well this this is the core of the of the um, of the Nutrix great argument basically that that risk is indeed significant it is there but we have to question it for two reasons. And the first reason is indeed um, that the first reason is because the absolute risk is very, is very low. Mm. The relative risk is just a way of expressing technically um, how much the risk will be amplified. Uh, but the more, in, the more meaningful absolute risk for an individual is never mentioned. Mm. And, and that is not 18%. That would be something like 1% increase in absolute risk or something. It would mean that instead of having a, a uh, a chance of developing colorectal cancer of 93%, it will become 94% uh, or, you know, or, yeah. or, or, or vice versa. Um, so it's a 1% change that basically you, you, you have. And, uh, but even if you look at the, the relative risk, um, if you talk about 18%, it means that basically that you will have to multiply your risk with 1.18. Okay. Yes. And that's a very, very small number. And, and the, pro and the point that, it, that, we have to take into account here is that that number is so small that we are not sure that it's not confounded. It yes. may be statistically significant, but does it actually mean that it's a causal effect? We cannot state that yes. from, from the data. Yeah, You can compare it to, to visceral fat, for instance, people that have lots of visceral fat and are, have a tendency to have hyperinsulinemia and, and metaflammation have a, have, have a very high risk on, on, on all kinds of chronic diseases, including colorectal cancer. And you would have to multiply the risk with the factor of six mm. in that case. If you're in the highest category of visceral fat, you multiply your risk with a factor of six. Now, yes. if you eat all that red meat, you will have to multiply it with a number that is close to one. You have that 1.18, yeah. uh, which is too low to make very hard causal conclusions. Yeah. And, and why is that? We know that, that it's very, you have to be careful here because th that association is an association that you'll find mostly in the United States. Mm -hmm. And you'll find it much less in different other places of the world. Um, in Europe, it's, it's less. And if you would go to Asia, you will find sometimes the inverse association. Yeah. Or we have the pure studies that look worldwide. Yeah. And they see that the more red meat people eat, the less chance on heart disease and, and, and the better mortality data they can, they can show. So it actually improves lifespan. Yeah. You get the complete opposite results. So how is it that the same food behaves differently in different places of the world? That's very bizarre. And that's just because of, of the healthy user bias. Yes. So what we talked about before, the historical background of meat, is something that, especially in the United States, has created a mindset that meat is something that is where meat is something that is bad for you. Mm. And people that are that are following the rules, people that are very healthy and are from the better socioeconomic classes are more prone to virtue signaling as well, but also are more, are also more, um, uh, they, they also stick to, to the dietary advice yeah. because they, they, they're educated and they also go more to the doctor, they, they drink less, they, they smoke less, they have more physical activity, they're, they're just very healthy people, which uh, you can try to correct for statistically. Yeah. And adjust, but you cannot correct for the whole lifestyle package. It just mm -hmm. isn't. It's just impossible. So what those that what what nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease is doing basically is capturing associations mm. that are more cultural than they are nutritional. They tell you more about the beliefs of a society than about what the food is doing. Yeah. Um, you just measure that in the U.S., people that eat less meat are the people that are the upper classes and the healthy people. 
Yeah. If you go to other places of the world, and that's why you get these inverse relationships in other places of the world, the association also necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that the meat is making them better off, but it shows you that people that have higher purchase power, or the, or the better socioeconomic classes can buy more meat. And mm. you're again capturing the upper classes, basically. Yeah. So this system is just capturing associations that are socioeconomic. Yeah. And despite the, the corrections for socioeconomical status that they try to introduce in their calculations, you cannot just cancel that out, especially if the numbers are so small, you just don't know what is noise and what is bias and what is artifact. So it is, it is not a foundation to come up with strong statements, especially if you feel that they're contradicted. They're contradicted with, with different cultural systems, but they also contradict it just by common sense. Mm. We're talking about an ancestral food that has been part of the evolutionary diets. It's a food that's eaten in much higher quantities by several communities worldwide. Uh, we're not even talking about the hunter-gatherers before uh, in, in, the, in the Pleistocene time, but even nowadays, hunter-gatherer communities or pastoralist communities, they consume much more red meat than, than we are consuming. And, they're, and they have been free of, of chronic disease until they have started to adopt the Western diet. Yeah. So it is not about the meat as such, it's about the Western lifestyles and the way Western diets are... are are packaged as a whole and, and isolating meat from that and maybe a couple of other things like sugar, which probably is, is likely more harmful. But but we put a lot of blame on red meat within that Western yeah. diet. Yeah. And there is no good basis to do so. Yeah. And it's so reductionist. And I appreciate what you're saying with that healthy user bias or conversely kind of unhealthy user bias. And it just astounds me when the whole idea that the people who might tend to eat more red meat and processed meat do it inside a burger with a coke mm. and with yeah. you know sitting down on the couch after binge watching something on netflix yet this is never talked about by these really smart people and the people who are responsible for putting together the reports that suggest we need to reduce red meat as a as a food group rather than actually look at hang on what is the dietary pattern? What is the lifestyle pattern? Maybe these are the messages that we need to make more clear because I feel like it's such a confusing space for people because of the authority that comes from the Heart Foundation and comes from the World Health Organization to say, you need to drop this you know, es essential part of our diet and drop it down more. Because of course, then we come to ask the question, well, if not red meat, then what? You know, What are we supposed mm. to replace it with? Yes. Have you included in your discourse um, the work of Weston Price or looked at his his information, Professor? But not not specifically, but mm. it is it clearly shows that uh, you create the problems when you start to interfere with traditional diets. And instead of of embracing the entire set of solutions we're seeing in front of us, you know, all the all all the mint because humans are are extremely flexible. If you think about it, we can be. It can be 100% almost um, or, or close to 100% animal source food based, mm. like the Inuit, mm. or we can be very plant based and still be fine um, as long as we have certain eating patterns that bring us all the nutrients. So there's, there's a whole spectrum there that can be used and that has been documented as well. And we also have documented that all those different dietary systems, once they start, to trans they start to transition into the Western style of diet, then the trouble starts. Mm. Um, we've seen it with the Inuit, we've seen it with, with, with uh, every, every single community that, that Western Prize described. Um, and it's, it's, it's a broad impact. It has to do with tooth decay, but it also has to do with, with uh, obesity. It has to do with diabetes quite, quite very often, mm. because probably it's also... Uh, community dependent maybe some communities react more strongly to you know heavy sugar loads than, than other communities and it can be it, it's it's dramatic it's uh it's really something that we should not tolerate anymore and and it's also very sad to see that we have uh with our diets we have ruined globally public health and we start to correct that public health with our own narrow system which yeah. is a very western system yeah. You know, the, the Mediterranean style diet kind of Western idea we have, mm. which first of all has nothing to do with the Mediterranean diet as such, which probably doesn't even exist. But we have that Harvard created model that we want to impose all over the planet to correct the damage that our diet has done. Yeah. Rather than 
emphasizing or trying to get those people back on track with their local food traditions and find let them find their own solutions again and just, just back off with our Western interventions. Yeah. Is it all lost? Like, like, are we too far gone now to come back? Like, what is your, where are your thoughts on where we need to head? And is it even possible to do so? Is it likely to happen? Or do you actually see that the voices of authority are too great and too in this direction to be able to come yeah. back to, to what you're proposing we need to do? Yes, I've always been on the side of the bottom-up approaches and, and let communities build their own system and their own functional you know, networks of things and, and people rather than the top-down approaches. And we're moving very quickly towards very centralized ideas, more and more. You yeah. see that, and it's not only about food, we see it with everything. Everything has to be centralized. We have this very, very top-down driven policies that we want to impose on a global level as well. And so it's going in the complete opposite direction. And the dangerous part is that that model, that top-down model is supported by, by the big corporations, it's supported by the World Economic Forum, it's supported by policymakers worldwide. So it's very, very difficult to counter it because mm -hmm. there's a massive force behind that. But the advantage of the bottom-up system is the numbers. You know, yeah. people still have the numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and if communities get, just get loud enough, I think they can achieve something. And I'm not completely pessimistic because I think it's possible. We see that some people start to reclaim their health because they switch their foods, the, their diets. They, they flip them around almost. They, uh, they ignore the advice and they just try to figure out what is best for them. Mm. And very often that comes down to avoiding ultra-processed foods and, and sometimes simple interventions. And that creates also uh, communities, yeah. grassroots communities. And you see them, you see that they are growing. You have the low carb community, for instance, that manages to get to solve part of their metabolic uh, dysfunctionality. Um, you will even find them in the plant-based uh, yeah. movements. You, you have all kinds of grassroots movements that start to grow and they create, and that's important, I think, they start to create an identity around their diet. And their diet becomes a symbol, a kind of totem where they can you know, build around. Um, which is not always good because it also creates sometimes tribal discussions, yes. but, uh, but it forges communities. And I think that is what will be a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, and you find it in, in dietary movements. You also find it in agricultural movements yeah. where people have new symbols that are much more community-based than they were before. And they, they're often very anti-authoritarian because they, they contradict what authorities often are saying which is very interesting to see that happening. There's also, of course, less grip of authority on public life. People, uh, you have the, the access to information now, which is basically becoming public. So everybody's finding its way. And, and eventually those options that are successful will grow. Mm -hmm. The other ones will disappear. So it's this duality, I think, between the top-down mm. uh, imposed system that is driven by big budgets and, and is supported by media and the bottom-up system that has no, basically, has no financial resources, but gets its strength from the community building. Yeah. The and I think we should not underestimate that because at some point in time, if uh, top-down becomes too oppressing, then the public reacts. We've always seen that throughout history. And I think that will be, if it breaks, it breaks. I mean, at some point yeah. in time, it could just have to change. Yeah, interesting. And, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking about how so many uh, countries follow the lead of the United States with regards to the dietary guidelines, or I, or I feel like it comes from the States. Of course, you mentioned the WHO, and, and that's obviously a large part of it as well. Brazil is the one country that I've seen that have almost kind of bucked the trend. And, you know, the way that I feel you advocate eating and, and the way that I certainly advocate the minimally processed food, the whole food, they really seem to have kind of got it right. Whereas there doesn't seem to be any other country in the world that, that kind of has, has yeah. done anything other than the status quo and what you see kind of, you know, recommended from WHO and, and out of United States and, and things like that. Yes, Brazil had, of course, it, it depends a lot on, on the, the group created by Montero. Mm. Which, and his Nova system, which are basically very much anti-ultra-processed foods. And he has 
a big influence over yeah. policy and he's he's quite you know he's quite respected in brazil so he managed to get a counter movement in a more official way in, yeah. uh, somehow but yeah that, that's that's something that not necessarily will be able to break through internationally because it's mm -hmm. still not what the other countries are are, are favoring it's a need for a new narrative yeah. it's a need for um, a new look at food for whole we have to put the emphasis on on the wholesome foods on the uh, minimally processed foods and i'm not i'm absolutely not against processing because i'm a process engineer so yes. i'm absolutely pro processing but we have to get rid of, of the ultra processed foods and 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 the best way to do that i think is to get inspired by food traditions to um, stop seeing food as a commodity yeah uh, and 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 start appreciating for what it is yeah and i think if you start from there you will also be interested in food and you will also be interested in where your food is coming from. Mm -hmm. And maybe you will start looking up where it comes from. Maybe you will start talking to the farmer that made it and get in touch with farmer communities mm -hmm. and build respect from there. Mm -hmm. So the respect for, for the food system starts with knowing where it comes from. And, and, and that is something that may also be a, a be a catalyst for change. Yeah. Um, and you see that with people that switch their diet, that they become more interested in where the food is sourced from. Yeah. So they start to look also into agricultural systems and they start to explore. And, and it's, a, it's a pathway to self-actualization, basically. They start learning about their food and it's, it becomes interesting. Yeah. You know, from, from the moment you, you don't see food anymore as the fuel you just take in and then you rush to your job. And, but you start thinking that it's something that is actually at the basis of health. And, and if you discover that you've been unhealthy all that time because of the food, well, you start thinking more about what you're putting in your mouth. And then, yeah. then the next step is to, to try to figure out where it comes from. Yeah. And before you know it, you're thinking about sustainability as well. And you're thinking about the function of food in communities, yeah. which is much more than just nutrients, right? It's, uh, it's, as with meat, but it's also valid for other foods. It's um, it's biosocial. It's it has a very strong cultural component. Absolutely, and you know, I feel like in New Zealand, there's a real opportunity because we are so small. You know, we're an yeah. island nation. We get a lot of our GDP comes from the agricultural and the oh, sorry, the the cattle industry and and things like that. And in fact, next year they're running a series of open farm days where people who live in cities like me can go and visit a farm and actually start to understand how how New Zealand farmers are doing it, and not just take the information from the North America that is conflated to the yeah. New Zealand environment. And so we can begin to appreciate how it's done here. Um, Professor, thank you so much for your time today. This has been such a great conversation. I do want to ask you just one more thing before we wrap up. And that is, what do you eat in a day? Talk me through a typical day's <laughs> food for you. Well, mostly the, I would say combinations of meat or fish and vegetables, right? Yeah. That's, What's your favorite meal? Uh, it's hard to say. The, mm. the, yeah, I don't have a cherry pick meal that I would say is my absolute favorite. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I was born at the coastside, so I, I like fish quite quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there's so many options to enjoy that I would feel bad by picking one that, okay. <laughs> that is my absolute favorite. It's a bit disappointing answer. <laughs> it is. So instead, I will ask, what, was, what did you eat at your last meal? My last meal was, uh, well, my, that's the thing with the food frequency questionnaires. You see, you forget what, your, <laughs> what your, last, your last meal was about. My last meal was just eggs with uh, bacon. <laughs> that was this for lunch. This evening, I'll have a picanha, a Brazilian uh, picanha. Right? Oh, what is that? It's, me, it's, it's red meat. Delicious. Well, that sounds fabulous. <laughs> Professor, thank you for your time. And uh, you've mentioned a lot of resources and, and things that I'll put in the show notes. In addition to your papers around the dietary guidelines for red meat, your debate with Professor, I think he's a professor, Neil Bernard, which, which we didn't even go into detail with, but would be a great conversation to have with you as well. So people can, you know, if they want more information, can follow those links, because I've certainly found this such an interesting conversation um, in and around the whole history of red meat, which I, I know very little about. So um, this has been really good for me. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me here and it was nice, nice talking to you. So 
so I hope that you enjoyed that conversation that I had with Professor Lewa and you I guess have a better understanding of where red meat sits in the diet and why some of those arguments for us to reduce our red meat aren't really based on kind of robust evidence so this isn't to convince you if you were vegetarian or vegan to start to eat red meat but it's just looking at it from a, I suppose a more objective perspective than what you might otherwise get if you're listening to messages in the media or from other organizations so next week, I'm joined again with my mate Cliff, Dr. Cliff Harvey, as we continue to address some of those questions that you submitted in and around your own health and nutrition goals. And if you haven't submitted a question, do not worry, because I don't doubt that you, you will also pick up some really great tips from Cliff, because he's a wealth of information and knowledge. And until next time, you can find me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin, and also over on my website mickeywillardin.com where you can also sign up to one of my meal plans based on real food nutrition, on fat loss or as an athlete plan where you get access to meal plans, to shopping lists, to weekly emails in and around evidence-based topics which I like to write upon and it's on a range of different topics. Also our private Facebook only members page where we have a weekly forum and you have access to ask me questions at any time through our online platform or the private members Facebook page. A lot of you have asked how you can support the podcast and at this stage the best way to do that is to sign up to one of the meal plans. And not to worry if you are vegetarian because I do also offer meal plans based around fish and vegetarian options also. So until next week guys, have a fabulous week, happy new year and I really look forward to you joining me in 2021 as I continue to bring you interviews with people such as Professor Lewa who are experts in their field of knowledge in health, nutrition, fitness and a whole host of other topics. So until then, see you soon. Mm -hmm.